Hello there again, and welcome to the Impact Zone podcast. I am back. I am here to review this week's episode of Impact May the 2nd and preview not only the upcoming Under Siege pay-per-view, but the May 9th episode of Impact. So, yeah, we've got a lot to talk about. We'll talk more separately about some of the stuff coming at Under Siege. They did make a couple announcements. It feels like it's a very smaller card, though I feel like they'll have some more stuff coming up on the actual show to an extent uh, than, than what they've kind of got. Highlight package opening up the show, uh, running through what's happened between Nick Nemeth, uh, Matt, Broken Matt Hardy and uh, the system having had Matt Hardy to replace Nick Nemeth in that six-man tag. Uh, Bun B and uh, First Class are in the VIP booth uh, to start the show, and the match first match is Mustafa Ali versus Chris Bay, baby, in his hometown. Uh, this wasn't a title match. Um, so it really like didn't didn't matter too much who won, but obviously like you think, well, the champion's not gonna win or not gonna lose rather. I'm, I'm already dyslexic today, apparently. I'm getting my things completely backwards here already to start with. Look out. Um but yeah, like there's no reason for Mustafa Ali to lose in this match because well He's got an upcoming match at Under Siege if it was against his actual opponent. That would make some sense. Like, unless you're just going to say, oh, well, Bay beat him and then there's something else and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't, it doesn't really work that well if you if you did that this way, like like that way or whatever. But, yeah, like, obviously Bay lost this match. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't without uh, a great effort and a great match in there. And it was a good match to kick off the show with. Um, a lot of, I'll say a lot, but a, a bit of interference sort of came at the end, uh, which, you know, cost Bay the match, um, you know, so yeah, it, it's a little bit, it's one of those things is, is it's TV match and whatnot. And it is like, again, shenanigans are hard to get around. Like, cause you always almost need shenanigans because you want somebody, you know, when somebody is going to win the title, to have people being like, oh, man, he overcame all the shenanigans that, you know, everyone else couldn't overcome, you know. So, yeah, well done to them, you know. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's tough to, to do that. I know people will, will, will complain about shenanigans and whatnot, uh, you know, costing someone a match, but that's the story. It's not just... Oh, they overbooked it or whatever. No, they put things in there for story reasons to continue, you know, this tie run of Mustafa Ali and make, you know, Bay look good. You know, like, so, yeah, like he looked good anyway, but he looked even better by the fact that, hey, it felt like, hey, he didn't really get beat. He got beat by the fact that, you know, somebody clobbered him over the head with a fucking flag on a pole or whatever, you know, like, so, uh, yeah. And sometimes that over overbooking can make things more interesting. Like, I know a few people were saying the Steph DeLander and Jordan Grace match uh, at Under Siege, uh, no, not Under Siege, at Rebellion, sorry, was that overbooked? Yes, of course it was, <laughs> but... Was it exciting? Was it interesting? Was it entertaining? Yes. So, like, and yes, perhaps they should have done that, like, after the match or whatever, but how, like, the story that they're trying to build on out of it sort of required it to to be so. So it's one of those things about why you're, why you're doing that, not just, well, we're going to overbook this. Why? Because... We want to overbook something, or that's the only way we know how to book things. They haven't done much overbooking, really, a lot in in the last few years. Like this was one of the first few ones that they've actually sort of done in, in a while. So it's it sort of makes people go, oh wow, you know. Uh, 
uh, back to it, I guess. But still, like, it's one of those things that you you can't get away from sometimes in trying to tell a story because there's only so many ways to tell it. And, uh, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, a little, uh, little highlight here of Bay doing a coast-to-coast -coast elbow on um, Mustafa Ali. This is one of, like, the key spots in... I want the key spots, but one of the coolest spots that were in the match. Uh, highlight here of Mustafa Ali trying to cheat using the ropes uh, to get the pin, but Ace Austin uh, pushing his feet off and the security uh, knocking down Ace Austin. Also, this German suplex, this high-angle suplex uh, from Mustafa Ali onto Chris Bay in the closing, very closing moments-ish of the match. Um, that looked very brutal. Um, but yeah. it was a very, it was a very good match uh, between these two. And like, it sh again, it, it it's one of those things like Mustafa Ali, and it's funny that he's kept his, his name because a few, most people don't get to keep their name, but you know, like, he, you know, he's still a fairly recognisable name. Even even Nick Nemeth, who, you know, everyone knows as Dolph Ziggler, you know, he's still a fairly recognisable name if you actually say, oh, that's Dolph Ziggler to somebody. You know, that's who Dolph Ziggler is. You know, that's his real name. That's, you know, him being him, but now he's on in TNA and in, in New Japan and blah, blah, blah. You know, people go, oh, okay, cool, whatever, or whatnot, you know, like, um, but yeah, like, his name still carries a lot of value to, to wrestling fans who, you know, might go, oh, man, Nick Nemeth, or whatever, you know, Dolph Ziggler's on this show, oh, Mustafa Ali's on this show, oh, wow, he just had a really good match with this kid that I've never heard of, but, you know, he looks good, you know, and you know, you might become a fan of them. And that's the point. Like, you're not you not just got these ex-WWE guys for no reason. Like, you've got them for a reason, and that's to help elevate what you're trying to do. Like, that's the problem that I always have with, like, AEW. They have 500-something ex-WWE guys and basically no one else, and it feels like, man, like, you're not doing anything with these ex-WWE guys uh, e either. <laughs> Anyway, like Miro, they didn't hardly do anything with him. Um, and, uh, yeah, but, yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to talk about that. I know that's a hornet's nest that I don't really want to kick, but still, it's just it's just interesting to, to, to look at it in that in that light, but whatever. Danny Luna versus Alicia Edwards. Like, these, these girls, these girls, <laughs> like, these girls, they're having, like, there's a main event knockouts match in on this show, which we'll be talking about in a few moments, ish, I guess, I don't know, but 20 minutes, who knows, I, I tend to ramble on, I don't know, but still, it is one of those things, but still, like, these girls, they had, they had a nice little match too, like, it wasn't, wasn't like a 10 out of 10 or whatever, but they had a, you know, pretty good back and forth little match that I think this was hampered a little bit for time, perhaps, I even think the main event was hampered for a little bit of time, but, or, a little bit of uh, missed opportunities there and, and whatnot. And I think, like, changing styles and whatnot and all that. But we'll get more into it a bit later. But anyway, it's one of those things. I think that this was this was cool, uh, little match. Uh, and you had uh, Marsha Slamovich and um, each of their partners sort of out, on the outside. Marsha got involved, hit Danny with the snowplow, uh, after a bit of a distraction, allowing Alicia to pick up the win, this gives them sort of some momentum sort of going into their knockouts title match um, at Under Siege. Now, I don't know whether I'll, I'll talk too much about their match at Under Siege here. I think I'll, yeah, I'll just leave it till we're talking about it at the um, Under Siege uh, preview. Uh, so... Yeah, we'll, we'll wait till we'll, we'll wait till then. But uh, on commentary, uh, Lars Fredrickson said that he'll be in um, Luna and well Spitfire's corner, effectively Luna and uh, Threat's corner. So for those people who want to tune in to see, uh, you know, 
that punk rocking guy, hey, he'll be there. <laughs> Sammy Callahan has a new TV show, or oh, basically, it's almost like a podcast, I guess, or it's his own stream. It's almost like the spotlight, I guess, with Alan Angels, like, I guess, to an, to an extent, except he doesn't have guests, I guess, I don't know. But this is good. Like, this is something that I feel like he would need, he needs, he needed to do something to come back. Like, and if you're going to get him just to do a generic promo or whatever, like, that's not who Sammy is. Like, that doesn't make any sense. It's nice to have a little bit of a promo per se from him to say, hey, I'm back. By the way, I'm doing this now. And I'm going to, you know, shed some truth on some things. And, uh, Course out some BS and tell it like it is, and I'm here to right the wrongs that were done before. Sounds interesting. I don't know, like, obviously, you don't know what that actually means, but it just is a developing thing, you know, like, it's a thing to start. Like, this is him back, you know, he started doing his thing, and this is cool. Like, you know, like, he has something else. Jonathan Gresham's coming back as well. Like, we'll be talking more about that in a bit, but again, like, if. It, like, TNA feels, like, so reinvigorated right now, and I know some people don't agree with that, but still, it feels, it feels like, like, on TV, in terms of, like, the talent that are there that have come back, it feels like, man, things are, things are getting better, so we just have to turn the corner somewhere, and, you know, like, it's inevitable in a sense thank you ace austin but it is inevitable like it is inevitable that they will turn the tide in in a sense because the product everything that they do um everything that they do you know is just too damn good the, the whole show that they put on the wrestling that they put on like on a consistent basis is just too good so they they have to have more than what they've got right now they're definitely going to like, break through that ceiling one of these days, but when it is, we'll have to wait and see. Um, and, like, again, distribution. Like, I, like besides getting a, a new network, which means we have to get a new owner, effectively, um, or somebody who will let us get out of the ownership that we're under, then, yeah, like, distribution is the only thing that will help on TV. Um numbers and whatnot so but whatever hammerstone versus cody diener and uh the fans decided hey we want a sin city street fight here uh and like i i think that this was a i think that this should have been a bit faster paced i think that this was a bit slow paced a bit too slow paced i should say i guess um which kind of aided ate up a lot of time um, for other matches and for other things, this should have kept been kept a, a lot shorter and and whatnot. It, it felt like a very prolonged squash match for the most part. There were some nice little spots in this and some good hope hope spots there from Diener, but this was this like again like Diener. I don't want to say that he's done for in wrestling because you could never say never that somebody's going to you know, break through that glass ceiling or he's going to get there one of these days. But I just, I don't see it. The dude's been wrestling for a long time. I think he knows that, hey, this is probably, you know, close to my last run doing something full time. And, hey, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to have fun with it. You know, cool. You know, I'm, I'm up for that. And, uh, you know, where does it lead where does it end i don't know like the same you could talk about like guys like pco or rick flair or anyone that have had a very long career like sting and other people like that but like even the motor city machine guns like we, we had them before uh here and they have gone going now still to a uh, to aw apparently i don't know but still like they're they're still in that age group the same as dinner you know like the best years are pretty much behind them and they've got maybe a couple of years left, maybe, you know, like, and I think that's, it's cool to see Dino doing, doing the stuff that he's doing. If this is going to be one of his last you know, runs, one of his last years, who knows, 
could you know maybe it might be five more years might be four more years it might be six more years who knows i don't know but you never know but you know if his body holds out and he's healthy good on him for doing his best he doesn't need to be the world champion he doesn't need to be anything he can just or he can be the tag team guy or he can do he can hold belts like he can hold anything but like he doesn't need to do that. I'm not saying that he shouldn't. I'm saying that he sh he doesn't need to. I think he's like anything that he's had in the business or any like legacy that he's could forge. I don't think it's going to happen for him now. I think like like I could be wrong. Never say never. But like I don't see it for him. So I think he's taken the role of you know helping to put other people over who have got a longer and. Uh, you know, brighter future in, in the business. And that's what I feel like this match, you know, kind of was. I think it should have been a little bit shorter. I think, like, it should have been a little bit more snappy and a little bit more um, short in, in in a sense. It was, it was good for what it was, but I felt like it was really quite slow and they really should have just, like, said, you know, cut a minute or two off of this just to make it feel like, you know... It, it was a it was a bit better paced uh, in a sense, and the Hammerstone was absolutely just demolishing you know uh, Dino left, right, and center, and it, he only just barely came back and and whatnot. But uh, whatever, it it was good. And uh, this this highlight here of Cody Dino after he tried several times throughout um, this fight, this match, whatever, um, <laughs> he finally got to slam Hammerstone. On a steel chair, ouch. Uh, yeah, being able to slam a big man like that, like, you should be able to, but, like, just being able to is, like, pretty impressive, like, you know, really, in many ways. Um, at least, you know, so. Crowd wanted the table here. So Dina got the table. Devon, get the table! It's not Devon, it's Cody. Shit. Uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, Hammerstone won with the torture rack. Um, so yeah, after putting Dina through the table. Uh, so Broken Matt and Speedball Mountain had a promo about deleting the system. Uh, of, in regards to their upcoming match at Under Siege, we've talked a bit about like where's Matt at, how long is he staying, that sort of thing. Um, so, it, it, short answer is, we don't know. Uh, long answer is, well, let's, let's find out. Like, let's find out together. And that's the fun of it sometimes. Like, if he's here until Slammiversary or whatever, until Bound for Glory or whatever it is, I think it's probably going to be a short-term thing for the most part. Maybe, maybe... His brother Nero will come, uh, and him and Jeff will go after them tag titles. I would like to see that. Um, and if that's their last match in TNA ever, I, d I don't know, but that would be a nice send off. Um, and you know, maybe a Hall of Fame induction. <laughs> I think that they deserve it. Um, they did a lot of good work. Um, I know that, that, that there's some controversy uh, that was surrounding them and whatnot leaving a few years back, but they obviously ironed those out a few years ago when Matt came back with Private Party and they were wrestling, I think it was the North, I think, something like that. Um, but, yeah, we will, we, will, we will wait and see on what's going on with, with Matt when what he's doing and how long he's sticking. Like I said, like w with the same thing with like, um, uh, a few people that are on the roster and it seems like they're here for a short, almost a short period of time. Anything could change. Like the way that, you know, WWE is operating. Are they going to be like, you know what? We'll bring you back in, Matt. Or is AEW going to be like, yeah, we'll bring you back in, Matt, and we'll do do something with you or whatever. Like, and we'll, this is what we'll pay you and blah, blah, blah. Like, if TNA's there and they're actually like, hey, you know, like, 
we know you're probably getting offers from these other places um, and we would love you to stick around even for a short period of time, um, you know, uh, but, you know, we have to figure out what you're doing to an extent as well, but, like, we can certainly figure something out for you guys to do um, somewhere here, um, and it wouldn't hurt, so, like, why not? Let's figure it out, but, yeah, like, it depends. It always depends. So how much is WWE going to try to get him? How much is AEW trying to get him? I don't know. And I don't, like I said, like, it's funny to say that, that you know, this is, this is again, a, a WWE, ex-WWE guy. But really, this whole gimmick, his most successful gimmick, besides, like, the gimmick that he came back with when he was feuding with Edge, which kind of died when he kind of lost. He could have lost in, in a certain way and been all right, but sort of, ruined his whole momentum and, and things like that. But still, um, yeah, um, I still think that his broken character is his most successful ever, like, run in in, in any wrestling. So I think uh, he's, he's sort of really got that TNA moniker on him, um, so, as well. Um what is going on with Jonathan Gresham's? Apparently, he's coming back for a match at Under Siege against Kushida. Uh, very interesting uh, video package as well. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, this is what again, like what wrestling does. It gives you something to get intrigued by, and then it gives you layers and layers and. It keeps building that, like, so what is going on? What, you know, you've got to ask, like, what, what is going on? What, what is this thing? What is this ink? What does it do? You know, does it ever come off? Blah, blah, blah. You know, etc. cetera. Um, it feels like, in my opinion, he's probably, it almost feels like he's got a Jekyll and Hyde kind of dichotomy going on which could be interesting. Like, you could do that. I think that that could be really interesting um, rather than just being full-on he's a heel or he's a face or whatever. Like, because I think he would be a heel more so than if if he was just, like, here and doing stuff or whatever. Like, from from all of this stuff, it already feels like they're try almost pigeonholing him into a heel-ish role with being against Kushida, because it's like Kushida's a pretty big baby face. Um, you could keep him baby face again, but you could also sort of show that, you know, uh, Dr. Moridati um, sort of side that, you know, side of him that, that you know, or that other side of him that, that it feels like, you know, what is going on? You know, this, this you know, did he mean to do that? Like, sort of thing, you know, but he can't sort of control it or, or, or something, whatever, you know. Uh, interesting. Interesting, and I can't wait to see it. it we'll be talking about more about it tomorrow, uh, about it today, about it in a minute. I am fried, apparently. I don't know what I'm talking about, apparently. So. <laughs> uh, sorry, guys, but, yeah, like, he, we'll be talking about it more in the uh, up coming Under Siege video. Um, Joe Hendry came out to do an apology <laughs> song for AJ Francis and Rich Swan. This was very entertaining and this was quite funny. And this was a pretty long segment, actually, honestly, really. This was um, this was several minutes long. and, and but, he, but the crowd was right into it. Like, and then, and like, uh, it gave me very much like Elias style vibes to it. Like, this is sort of something Elias would kind of do. It was, you know, like him sitting in the middle of the ring with his guitar, playing songs and whatnot. Um, you know, and, and it was it was quite 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 good. Of course, this continues the rivalry between them, and we'll have to wait and see kind of where that's heading i don't really know um so yeah uh but we'll, we'll have to we'll have to keep our eyes 
and he's on it. Well, I don't know because like he's already lost to Swan. He's kind of lost to Francis. Like it almost feels like again, you need to put them in a lockdown sort of environment. Interesting that a few feuds have kind of, you know, pushed themselves into being almost feuds that need lockdown. That'd be nice. Uh, um, uh, so that'd be interesting. Like, it'd be the first lockdown in freaking forever, dudes. Um, but yeah, I'm sure people would like to see it. Oh, man. I don't know. It's it's tough for me to say, which, to say which of these next two matches was match of the night in some ways, but I think that this match was match of the night. Trey Miguel versus Ace Austin because it had, like, again, like, we all know the story because we all have been watching TNA for Impact, whatever, for the last, like, six years or so. And these guys have both been in that company and been doing stuff together for the last six years, like, whatever it is. So they have a big backstory of lore behind their match. And, you know, that plays to, like, the match being really, really like, good, because they know each other, you know, and they can counter each other's stuff, and they can, you know, tell that kind of story, and they're both great athletes, and they're just both really great pro wrestlers, both who deserve, you know, eventually, and I think Ace Austin and Chris Bay are getting closer to this, you know, upper mid-card sort of level, and I think Trey Miguel and, and, uh, his friend Zachary Wentz shouldn't be too far behind because, again, if you're going to tell this story of their forever rivals, they've kind of got to be on the same page. Like, maybe one is slightly catching up to the other to an extent, but you've kind of got to keep them on the same page um, because otherwise, you know, where's the rivalry you can obviously go back to it a few years later, but and you don't want to overdo it, but again, like, yeah. Anyway, it is one of those things. The battle was fierce between these two. Like, not that it wasn't fierce between Manashida and uh, Jordan Grace at times, but yeah, I think that this match was the match of the night for me. Um, yeah. Uh, highlight here of uh, Trey going for his uh, you know, kick combo into his uh, neckbreaker thing that he does, uh, but Ace Austin reversing it and uh, eventually coming to uh, hit the fold and uh, secure the win and become number one contender. Absolutely great match uh, between these two. Uh, and there was a small backstage promo uh, between Josh Alexander and Eric Young. I don't know why it says, uh, you know, Kazarian here. Don't know. Uh, but whatever, they're, uh, they're going to face it under siege. Um, really want to talk just quickly about the graphic here. Um, because like they, they do some really good graphics. This was a really good graphic. Um, and like special graphics for special matches, I feel are important and like it, or even so it like helps people recognize, Hey, this is kind of like a special match or maybe it's the main event. Hey, you know, like, right. but anyway, it, it's just one of those things. Um, and Ash by elegance was of course in attendance for this one as well. Can we can we actually progress like that story? Uh, I'm kind of I hope they actually will soon, which I think they probably will soon. But it it it's feeling like man, come on, come on, you're trying to do something here, obviously, but it's like come on, let's let's move along a little bit and actually do something with this. I'm sure that they will, but it's just like oh man, come on. Um, Miu, who we saw at, um, 
Was it uh, the second multiverse or was it the first? I can't remember. <laughs> can't remember which. I know she faced Kill Kelly um, in one of them. I think that they even referenced. Uh, maybe she was in both. Actually, I think she might have been in a fatal. F oh yeah, she was in a fatal four way. I think um, between Diana, Giselle, and I can't remember who else. I'm sorry, the fourth person. Uh, <laughs> Uh, for number one contention. Oh no, was it for the title at that time? Because some somebody had vacated or was vacated. Oh no, it was Mickey James, who I think had gotten injured? Question mark. And there was some question about whether she could turn up and wrestle and all of this. And in the oh no, was it? Uh, it wasn't Jordan Grace because Jordan Grace faced Diana in a singles match, which determined the champion. I just can't remember, like, it's going to bother me. I'm sorry. It's going to bother me who it is because I don't remember, but whatever. It, it is what it is. My brain's obviously fried, as I said, several times in this. Um, but this match, I felt like, again, like, I felt like it was like, I think I said this, but it was strained for time. But in a sense that, again, I felt like they just should have gone bells for leather, like, in, in a lot of cases. Like, like, obviously, wrestling is a fight between two people. And you want to try to have that feeling out process and yada, 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 and whatnot. You don't want people to, quote-unquote, no-sell too much stuff and whatnot, that sort of thing, especially. But still, like... It almost felt like they didn't like they didn't really know what to do out here at times. This was a good match, despite that, despite everything that I'm just saying here. But like, it really did feel like, man, we we're we're we want to put on. You should be putting on the gas now, and you're just sort of like standing there and doing poses and stuff and whatever. Like, yes, that can work. And things like that, if you're if you're a heel or whatever, or trying to trying to get something or trying to get the fans back into the into a match or trying to build up for that comeback or whatever, that sort of thing, that can work. But just like you need to you need to keep moving, like the match forward, not just being like, unless your opponent's injured or something. Like you need to be like, okay, well what am I gonna do next? Because my you know, like Instead of just standing here and being like, oh, I'm the best, I? you know, whatever, or even just doing that, like, you know, like, it's tough to say that doing the whole leg clap thing is kind of like doing anything, but again, like, you're trying to psych yourself up, you know, you're trying to, I'm going to go for it, I'm going to go for it, you know, like, you know, I'm going to go for this dive, you know, like, I don't know. It, everything, not everything felt like that, but like a lot of the match really felt like that. Maybe because it does have, like, you do see it picture in picture and you get to see the stuff that's in the ad breaks. Like, I like to see the full match most of the time, but like, I don't know whether or if you just saw like, like some of it, um, out of it that it'd just be better. I don't know. Like, but still, like, the action did heat up. Um, after this DVD on the apron um, and whatnot. But, like, I, as, as we said, or as I said before, like, it wasn't really, there wasn't much thought of or speculation or doubt or whatever of, like, Jordan winning here, I don't think. So, yeah, it's like, well... If the end's kind of predictable, it's hard, like, like, you, especially then, like, you even, like, you want to have that pushed into the forefront of your mind in, in making a match like this. Like, people know or think they know I'm going to win, so we have to do everything in our power to make Miyu look like an absolute beast throughout this whole match. Less I can do some stuff and come back and do things. I'm not fucking dead here, but... Like, I need to make Miyu look like a fucking, you know, dragon in this match and, like, take an absolute tarring all over the place 
like this was one of the be better uh, parts of, of it as well. But still, like, it, like if you're going to do a match like this, you need to get people to be like, holy shit, I think they're changing the title, even though, I, you know, we, we don't, we, like, that doesn't make any sense. But still, you've got to get people being like, holy crap, you know, she's done all this stuff, she, you know, you know. She dropped her right on her head at one point. I think actually, I think that was me who got dropped right on her head. But that should have been Jordan getting dropped right on her head, you know, and things like that. So that it gave more drama. And it's tough when you've got two baby faces as well, I guess. So or sort of baby faces. And yeah. But Jordan retains. Shenanigans after the match with Steph Delander coming down to uh, attack Jordan. And Khan coming out to rip her neck, or snap her neck, break her neck, whatever. But PCO comes in uh, to fend them off. And uh, Steph Lander again trying to seduce PCO uh, and whatnot. I, I'm feeling like that's going to play into it, maybe. Um, but uh, the baby faces cleared the ring and the heels were on the outside. Uh, so. And then Impact went off the air. Um, now, I think that the upcoming matches are actually on another page, so let me find it. Now, as I say, <laughs> I've found it. Um, but yeah, like this uh, won't be all of the matches, obviously and clearly, but this will be for after Under Siege. We've got Zaya Brookside versus Ash by Elegance. Ash by Elegance is having a match at Under Siege as well, which is really weird that it, considering that it's not against Zaya. Um, I feel like their feud kind of deserves a pay per view match, even if it's on the pre show. Like, I don't know. Like,. But then again, may like like I think you should you should really do that. Honestly, I don't understand this. Like in some ways, like w what's the point in this? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't. I don't understand the purpose behind the match that she's having at Under Siege. Like, whatever. That's probably why it's on the on the pre-show. But we'll talk more about that later on when we're talking about Under Siege. Tasha Steeles versus Ali Catch, so Ali Catch is back, at least for this match. And Tasha Steeles hasn't gone. So all those rumors that I've heard about her leaving and going to AEW and all that kind of sound a little bit off right now. Um, but maybe she's leaving. Who knows? I don't know. But I don't see it now. So here she and since here she is. And I don't know her contractual status, but I'm sure she's signed for a little while. So we will wait and see. Alan Angels versus Leon Slater. It's nice to see Alan Angels back. But again, it feels like, hey, he's just sort of floating in and then floating out again. I don't know. Uh, I kind of want him to be there. Well, not every week. You don't need to be there every week. But it's still like you need to be like consistent. Not like, oh, I'm here this week few weeks later, oh, I'm here again, but you weren't here for, like, three or four weeks, dude, like, so, uh, yeah, like, that, like, that's really not that amazingly good or whatever, like, this, uh, upcoming championship, uh, what is it, 16-man tag match could change a lot due to what happens at Under Siege, so, you know, we'll have to keep our eyes on, on that to an extent, but, Right now, it is Brian Myers and Eddie Edwards, the tag team, male tag team champions, I guess I should say that, uh, Laredo Kid and Jordan Grace, with Spitfire, the Knockouts tag team champions, Mustafa Ali and Moose, aka all the champions that are in TNA, against eight other people, eight other superstars uh, in TNA. Uh, that is going to be a huge match. Um, and I guess it's sort of to set up, in some ways, a lot of contenders-ish to each one of them um, post Under Siege and going into Against All Odds. Against All Odds is only a couple of weeks later. Um, so, again, they have a short um, build time um, for a lot of, uh, a lot of this, uh, stuff. 
coming up. Under Siege. We will talk more about Under Siege in the upcoming video. So that is what we can expect uh, going there. Um, so Leon, my dude, he's 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 great. Like, but I and I feel like this is a token, another token win for him. But I feel like his current story, if he has one, is kind of against the Rascals, specifically against Zachary Rents right now. So I kind of feel like he could lose, but I feel like he shouldn't lose. I think he needs a win. Um, but then again, he doesn't a thousand percent need it because if he gets screwed over by the Rascals, that will get him more heat, which will help him out in you know, the long term, when he does beat Wentz at a certain point, which I know, I'm assuming will be against all odds. Um, so I will leave the 16-man tag for us because that's going to be really tough because we don't even know all of the opponents. Tasha steals an alley catch. Again, alley catch, we don't know if she's staying, she's going, what she's doing. So it's nice to see her, but I feel like this is a token win for Tasha. I don't know what she's going to do after this. Like, like there's been a few rumors saying that she's leaving or had already even left. Um, and she was going to AEW, but that, or whatever, that that's always the rumor apparently. But it's, I always find it funny, these people who say, uh, or spread these rumors about, you know, t uh, TNA stars going to AEW. These are the people that are always saying, oh, TNA hasn't gotten any stars, so we don't, we don't care. But then as soon as, like, it seems like one's coming over or one has a contract elapsing, it's like, oh, my God, we're going to get this person on our roster. But whatever. That's because TNA makes stars, people, and no, and they don't. But whatever. I'm not trying to kick that horn and it's too much, but still. Um, Zaya Brookside versus Ash. Ash needs to win this, in my opinion, right now. Because, again, it, like... We were just talking about the whole stuff with Jordan Grace. Like, they need to further her story with, like, Jordan. And, like, Jordan needs more challenges. So it's like, well, let's do something about this and, like, you know, push Ash to the top. I don't know even who else she can go against. Really, there's hardly any other baby faces that aren't in tag teams that she sort of could go against except for the champ. So it makes sense. Uh, 16 man tags since we don't even know who the other challengers are. You can see some outlines there, which is kind of interesting. You could almost make out some of them, though, actually, in some ways. I feel like it's almost a mirror image. Yeah, I think it's a mirror image of the, uh, the champions. So, yeah, there you go. That's, that's how they've done that. They've just you know, superimpose that backwards effectively. So that doesn't give us any real clues. But it's basically anyone and everyone else that's going to be almost on the roster. Josh Alexander, um, I would assume, um, Eric Young. So, yeah, like those those would be two. You need two women, so I'm assuming DK or MK Ultra, Or maybe, again, like, since, like, again, this is after Under Siege, I feel like we might want to talk about... the tag team champions not being the tag team champions so we'll have to wait and see more about that but we'll we'll see that when it goes down i think it might even not even be next week we don't even know so there'll be more matches than this obviously on that show but again like this is just one of the featured mat oh these are just some of the featured matches that'll be on those shows um for those people that are going and then some of the other stuff will be um you know it will be uh produced later and filled in for for tv or there'll be other segments um so that is for uh well, some of the stuff for next week and some of the stuff for the week after that so we'll probably be talking about some of these matches again uh when that's going down so yeah but uh guys i hope you have enjoyed this one i hope you will join me again in another one definitely Join me in the uh, Under Siege one as well. Peace.